Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast. Yes, IT and OT are converging. So how does this affect compliance? Sponsored by Forescout. My name is Carol Auth of SANS. Today's featured speakers are Brandon Workentine, Systems Engineer at Forescout, and he will be moderating today's webcast, and Don Weber, SANS Instructor. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenter, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Brandon. Thank you, Carol. Uh, so today we're going to talk about IT and OT convergence and compliance. Uh, my background a little bit, I, were, I was a teacher at middle school and high school level for about five years and then decided to uh, go get an IT degree and the college happened to be st ha starting a cybersecurity program. So I was like, this sounds like fun and ended up totally changing my career path. Uh, I went to work for a nonprofit focused on cybersecurity for the electric sector uh, directly after that getting that degree and so I got involved in the NERC-SIP world. Uh, if you're familiar with the electric sector, most of a uh, big part of security is actually compliance and so that's how I got involved in this topic. Uh, as a former, I taught math and English and as a former English teacher I love the, uh, it's enjoyable to, enjoyable to me to spend time looking at what the actual words means in compliance regulations and so I'm, I'm kind of a nerd like that where I find that enjoyable so uh, that's kind of my background uh, Don is going to uh, introduce himself thank you Don uh, thank you Brandon uh, hello my name is Don Weber and uh, as mentioned I'm a SANS instructor I uh, help teach I'm one of the instructors for the industrial control systems 410 class and I also am currently teaching the uh, hosted class for uh, named uh, assessing and exploiting control systems. I'm teaching it at the Gas and Oil Summit right now here in Houston. Uh, I have a background uh, in multiple uh, areas uh, within security. I've been doing it since 2002. I've been a security manager for uh, different organizations. I worked with a uh, prominent boutique uh, security assessment team uh, for about five and a half years uh, doing uh, assessments uh, and security research on smart grid technologies. And some of you may know me from my smart meter talk, talk that I gave at Black Hat and DEF CON a few years ago. Currently, I'm working at uh, Cutaway Security and uh, we help clients with security assessments and pen tests of ICS environments, specifically uh, helping them understand how their security programs uh, are uh, helping to protect those environments and uh, uh, helping them improve that. Thank you, Brian. I'm not, I'm not hearing any audio. Am I the only one? People. Okay, go ahead, Brandon. I can hear you now. I, I hear you now, Don. Sorry, go ahead. But were you not hearing me before? Yeah, I, there was a break in your audio. Uh, where, where did I leave off? I apologize. I think right when the start, the slide was starting. If we hear it again, I think I'll have you switch to telephone. I, I think I, I passed it off to Brandon. So uh, um, okay. let's, let's go okay. ahead and go there. Okay. All right. We apologize for that. A uh, little technical glitch. Uh, so as I was saying, the uh, OT and IT worlds are really converged now. Uh, the, ben the business benefits to having OT devices networked and uh, able to talk to and able to get the uh, predictive analytics, the, uh, the being able to more rapidly bring things online and offline with just-in-time manufacturing, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the, the, sh the ship has left the port. Uh, 
in terms of whether IT and OT are going to be converged. And so, and for the most part, even when uh, an OT network is supposed to be separate, a lot of times it's not really separate. There's dual home hosts, there's, the, uh, there's stuff let through the firewall because a vendor needs remote access, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so, what we're going to focus on today is kind of the effects of that convergence and how it affects different um, d different compliant a few different uh, regulatory uh, compliance standards. Uh, I, IT and OT have some similarities and some differences. I'm not going to read everything on the slide, but uh, obviously the the big one that everybody always talks about when uh, when we do uh, security, uh, I, like ICS Security 101, uh, the big one is the change in the OT focus on availability, while the uh, the IT focused more on confidentiality uh, of things like uh, email and that kind of thing. Uh, there, there are some sim similarities, though, like uh, lack of resources. I think both IT and OT security people would say they don't, they don't have enough money, they don't have enough people in, involved, uh, and that, that is one of the largest uh, pain points right now in, in industry. And it, it really makes that, that lack of resources uh, makes things have to you, you have to change how you approach uh, meeting and proving compliance in order to deal with the fact that you may not have all the resources you want. Uh, and kind of to go along with that, uh, the, the resources to prove compliance can sometimes take away from the resources you have for uh, providing or improving sec the security posture of your organization. Um, uh, talking about the ITOD uh, convergence, we got a question about whether this uh, breaks the Purdue model. Uh, I would say, uh, I would say the Purdue model still has a place uh, when you can still, e even if you you're getting the data out from the OT networks to the corporate networks to be able to do remote management, to be able to do. Uh, to, to be able to do, do the business analytics that uh, big data allows you to do. I've, uh, you, you can do that from a, and, and still have a, a fairly well-defined Purdue architecture. You might, do, you might uh, have to define things where uh, communications might only go one way, uh, whether that's by uh, access control list or something so that you're sharing information out but not allowing remote uh, control of ICS assets. Uh, there's, there, there's things like that that you can do to still, to still have it. And for me personally, I just think that uh, the Purdue model show, uh, even if it's not 100% uh, every zone and conduit that you might want is, in, is uh, all, all traffic goes through every only defined conduit and there's only one or two conduits uh, between every zone, even though if you might not have that in the real world, it still gives you a way to think about your architecture and think about uh, attack paths and, and all that. So uh, I, I, I've heard, uh, obviously, if you go to uh, other conferences and in the ICS security world, there's talk about whether the Purdue model is dead or alternatives to the Purdue model. Personally, I still I still like it and I don't uh, think that there, I haven't seen anything that really strikes me as a uh, good alternative for at least leading that discussion. And, and Brandon, I can I can talk to uh, um, the, this question as well a little bit, provide a little bit more information. Uh, SANS is definitely uh, um, working with the uh, industry uh, vendors, uh, uh, customers, and uh, integrators in the information that we're providing to them as part of our training and the 
Purdue model is implementing the P Purdue model uh, to provide that security to the OT environment, protecting it, leveraging uh, um, their interactions with the IT environment, and uh, uh, but also leveraging the Purdue model, uh, uh, integrating out a little bit more the uh, ICS 410 class um, has our uh, reference architecture uh, uh, that uh, leverages the Purdue model to help with some of the issues that you're talking about here. Thank you. Yep. Uh, so uh, going on when we talk about uh, ICS uh, and industries affected by this convergence, it's really uh, all ICS. You could probably make an argument that uh, nuclear would be the one industry that's not affected by it. Uh, and But other than that, uh, as, as I said, the business drivers uh, I, I know there's still some, even some big name ICS security people who uh, argue about, uh, who argue that we should keep them separate, but uh, just the business drivers, I, I think that sh that that uh, that ship has sailed, and uh, we're seeing it across across every industry now. And uh, just a, a little background, some. Uh, the challenges to securing OT networks, uh, it's not just cybersecurity. Uh, when, when you're talking about uh, cyber, I work for a company that's focused on cybersecurity in the industrial control sector. And uh, most of the time when we do our sales, uh, I was a sales engineer. I actually left that role last week. Uh, but uh, uh, when we, when we would talk about sales, a lot of times secure, cybersecurity would be what would bring us into the room to start the discussion. The uh, organization might have a um, uh, a security team that's like that says that we need to get visibility into our OT networks because our CISO has now been given this responsibility, uh, and, and we really don't know what we have. Uh, the, the cybersecurity team might not understand the uh, OT background, what exactly all the devices do, and they can ha have a slow response time to threats. So we saw this in uh, the uh, Middle Eastern tri uh, Triton uh, malware where the plant tripped once uh, due to the malware and it was not identified as a cybersecurity event. Uh, got brought back online and then uh, the plant actually tripped again uh, due to the malware. And so uh, that that kind of thing, it's not, even though cybersecurity events may not be the most common on OT networks, uh, when they, because they're not as common, uh, they may not be identified as readily also. Uh, uh, but what we do see all the time is networking uh, and operations issues, where those those are the uh, uh, the operations and the, whether devices are working correctly, are uh, whether you have an accurate inventory of your uh, devices, uh, accurate documentation, that that kind of thing uh, is really hard to do uh, if you're using manual processes. If you're if you're not uh, if you're not bringing in some of the visibility that security tools can provide, then it it, it can be more difficult to make sure that those things are up to date. Uh, and uh, when we're talking about uh, security regulations, the SANS uh, 2019 I, uh, State of ICS Cybersecurity Survey, uh, I asked about which uh, standards are used within industry, and the uh, uh, a little over a third of the respondents said they use the NIST cybersecurity framework, uh, and then a, a little under a third uh, talked about the 853 series controls and 882. We'll talk, we'll talk about those two, and then we'll also talk about NERC SIP, uh, which was uh, is really specific to the electric industry. So uh, those are the ones that we're going to focus on today because they have the, uh, they, they seem to have the uh, widest adoption. 
So talking about the NISC cybersecurity framework, uh, this is the, it was rated as the most popular framework by uh, the respondents to that SAN survey. Uh, and it is really a, uh, a more, it's not a prescriptive framework as much as a uh, descriptive uh, framework to describe how uh, how you can tie your uh, cybersecurity into your overall risk management processes. Uh, the uh, the NIST CSF got a uh, big push from the government when it was first. Uh, uh, released and it, it it's, has a broad adoption across all, uh, all all industry verticals. It, uh, the CSF is broken up into five uh, categories. The first one we're going to talk about is uh, the identify uh, side of things, and this is really about providing visibility into uh, what you have, uh, I, I, being able to identify uh, what you have, what's on your network, how do they uh, talk to each other. Uh, and some of the uh, best practices that we're going to, that uh, we like to talk about is uh, the need to do this automatically and in OT networks. If you can do it uh, passively, uh, that, that can help a lot. Uh, when you go into an OT network, especially if you're coming from the IT background, uh, the engineers involved in running that network oftentimes don't want you to touch things. Uh, they're worried about you breaking things. They don't think you understand what, uh, what their concerns are. And so uh, a lot of times you can get kind of that first entry into uh, uh, as an IT person or an IT security person, you can get your first entry into that uh, uh, space by uh, being able to talk to them about how you do things passively. Uh, you're not you're not going to affect the network. You're not going to go uh, uh, touching all the devices. You're not going to go changing their workflows on them. And that that kind of foothold into the uh, organization can allow you to uh, start a program and then uh, grow from there. And Brandon, that's uh, to your point there. To, since you brought that up, you know that's that's one of the things that uh, the uh, we try to do with the uh, the ICS 410 class, with the assessing and exploiting uh, and control systems class, was to help educate people, uh, whether it's the security professionals, uh, but also the uh, engineers, uh, uh, operators, and technicians, the the managers that are. Uh, securing these uh, uh, the ICS environments, uh, helping them understand what tools and techniques they should be considering when they're coming in to do some of these identifications, what are safe ways to do it, and, uh, and training their personnel on, on how to do that communication and, and prep work around that. So it's uh, uh, while it is a challenge, it, it can be done effectively with uh, um, some training, some uh, communications between the teams, uh, both the IT and OT. Thank you. Yep. Uh, the the next step, so the uh, cybersecurity framework kind of uh, follows this uh, uh, wheel or circular path where you identify what you have, and the next step is to put in safeguards to protect what you have uh, to ensure that you can uh, provide the services that you you need to, whether that's delivering power uh, to customers or May, uh, running your manufacturing line, whatever the, what, what, whatever your output may be. Uh, some of the requirements are uh, to in, ensure that you uh, control that access to uh, and, and protect it. And what we like to talk about in here is uh, having the ability to uh, uh, kind of a crawl walk crawl, walk, run approach where uh, you might uh, first log, be able to log things and then you can uh, take that visibility, uh, take, take the monitoring that you're doing 
and be able to uh, have ha have a baseline of what's good, uh, and then be able to uh, grow grow from that into more of a protect uh, protection framework where you might be uh, blocking things, take t uh, identifying compromised hosts, that kind of thing, and taking them offline, having having a uh, having an idea, but uh, kind, kind of have that defensive baseline uh, uh, by using network monitoring, you're able to uh, protect the devices, identify, uh, e identify malicious or anomalous traffic and events uh, with, without impacting the, uh, the operational networks. Uh, and that, that goes into uh, when, when you have your protections in space or your protections in place, the next step would be would then be to detect uh, attacks that occur. Uh, but the, and in this, uh, the more broad you, the more broadly you can uh, check for things, the, the obviously the more effective you're going to be. So uh, by having, uh, by being able to monitor a network, you're able to think, see things like uh, unauthorized connections, malware spreading on the network, uh, uh, DN DNS queries to malicious domains, all that kind of stuff. Uh, by having a centralized uh, monitoring uh, system, you are able to take that uh, take that information that is already on the network, uh, especially in OT networks where most protocols are clear text, uh, the, the activities that, that are going on on the network are able, to, you're able to see them just by uh, passively listening. You don't have to uh, decrypt or man in the middle traffic or uh, anything like that and to, to have that visibility. Uh, and, uh, and then when you, when you do Get it, whatever monitoring solution you have, you want to be able to make sure that integrates into your uh, SIM or or uh, whatever you're using. Because uh, there's, uh, I know uh, some vendors don't don't like it when I say this, but uh, there's no such thing as a one uh, a single tool that is going to protect your network. Uh, wh wh whatever security tools you use, uh, the ability to Tie those together and integrate them via API uh, or or sharing of information, like through a syslog server or a sim or something like that. Uh, it's really important that your security tools play play together nicely in order to uh, make your uh, uh, investigations and your threat hunting, all that kind of stuff, is as easy as possible on your workers because uh, that that's what if, if there are uh, if, if your tools introduce unnecessary uh, pain points to using them because they don't integrate with other tools, then your employees are not going to be very happy. So, so Brandon, this is a, this is one of uh, and you know we can talk about challenges in each areas, but definitely getting logs back uh, from uh, the uh, different management servers and uh, all the way down to the devices within the ICS environments. Is certainly a challenge for a lot of the clients that I've uh, helped with in, in doing assessments on. Uh, but where the challenge also comes from is if they are getting that information, uh, typically the uh, enterprise, uh, the, the people that are looking at these logs uh, and doing the analysis and so forth, they don't necessarily know how to respond to things uh, within that network. They don't, uh, and so they typically default to, to not doing anything, uh, maybe doing some alerting. So some people are doing it better than others, but typically that's uh, that's got to be something that's addressed. Logging first, uh, and then the analysis and how to respond, uh, because it's definitely different uh, between the enterprise network and the OT network, and that needs to be taken into consideration. Yeah, thanks, Don. Uh, yeah, the I have actually done uh, we trainings with uh, SOC teams for some of our customers uh, for that exact reason that uh, especially when you have something like the security team is being told hey now you're going to be responsible for the OT network uh, they have the visibility uh, they need to know 
who to talk to. They need to know who to, uh, 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 how to respond, what the alerts mean, uh, all that kind of stuff. And so it, it's not something that they're just going to automatically know. You have uh, having a, a way to impart that knowledge is important. Uh, and uh, to, to continue around the uh, wheel on the NIST cybersecurity framework, uh, the next step is to respond. So you've identified events. Uh, the, the, once, once you have that identified, whether from alerting, from threat hunting, whatever it is, uh, to respond to it. And really one of the key things uh, from, from this is to uh, have a plan. And this gets back to what uh, Don was just talking about. Uh, uh, have have an incident response plan. Uh, know, know what you're going to do. Know what information you're going to need to have. Uh, when, you, when you get an alert, uh, make, make sure that uh, you, you have a traffic capture or a PCAP file of what caused that alert so that you can do that uh, forensics analysis or you can uh, you, you can uh, ensure that uh, that the investigation can be can be done uh, and that that's again where having a broad centralized uh, uh, management interface where you can see a network map and you can uh, see when, when I'm doing uh, investigations uh, for, for new things, if, if something, uh, and I see something interesting, so uh, uh, such as a malware alert, uh, an, an alert for eternal blue or something like, uh, one of prime malware or something like that, uh, one of the things I wanna look at is who else is this uh, asset talking to? Uh, can, is, is it reaching out to the public internet? Is it, uh, is it on multiple other uh, uh, corporate networks, or or is it just uh, uh, does it have connections to other multiple other part, subnets of the corporate network where that malware may be able to spread? All that kind of stuff uh, by being able to get a centralized view at it uh, and uh, being able to dig in dig into what's happening. Uh, that that's that's the kind of questions that an analyst may have. And uh, and Brandon, the one of the uh, good ways to to help improve this, identify issues uh, within the ICS environment, especially uh, with the communications uh, to the IT team from the corporate, is to just have some incident response uh, scenario tabletops. Uh, not nothing complex. Sitting down with uh, some natural uh, everyday occurring things and uh, having the the proper people within the room and just talk through and walk through. Uh, uh, different scenarios and see where some of the gaps are, gaps in communications, identifying asset owners, uh, who to call about whether something needs to, uh, is expected or not, uh, that, that can go a long way. It's part of what we do on the last day in the, uh, the ICS 410 class is actually have the class sit through uh, an incident response tabletop talking about how they would respond to different events, what they would be looking for, how they'd be acting and so forth. So it's uh, it's a great way to start or uh, understand your gaps uh, within your response process uh, so that uh, you can move forward effectively. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, you've, you've responded to your event. Uh, the next, uh, step of the IC of the uh, uh, CS cybersecurity framework is to recover and so you uh, th this goes al along with uh, responding you uh, it, it will likely be a part of the same uh, response and recover plan uh, how are you going to get back to your uh, uh, how are you going to get back to your uh, normal operational state uh, that may Im include talking to uh, third parties that uh, and then an, uh, an important one is after the fact lessons learned uh, uh, by and, and again it uh, some of the four scout best practices over there on the side uh, by being able to it, it's really key 
to, to be able to provide uh, the uh, proof of what happened and uh, be able be able to walk through that. So, uh, do you have a PCAP? Do you have uh, a record NetFlow records? Uh, do you have that kind of thing uh, where you can uh, identify uh, uh, what worked and what didn't? And maybe maybe you found out you did not have some of the information you wanted. Uh, uh, so that so that kind of thing. Uh, 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 the recover is is uh, an important one, and, and that learning from past events to identify whether that past event is an actual event or a tabletop exercise, uh, so, or or both. I was in, in a previous job. I was at a, a tabletop exercise for a uh, municipality, and uh, something somebody came got came into the room and got somebody and. Uh, they had an uh, event happen during the exercise, and he asked. In the person who was first notified about it, talked to a couple other people, but then they were like, "Oh, uh, identified a couple other people who were not in the tabletop exercise that they needed to talk to about this event," and that uh, goes into. Uh, and, and it was like that. That was a great learning opportunity as they found found out, oh, this is who we should have had in the room for the tabletop exercise as well. Uh, and uh, we got a question slash comment pointing out that uh, it, it all starts with the leadership on that, uh, why it matters uh, to get that buy-in, uh, uh, I'd be able to convince your uh, organizational leadership that you, uh, what the issues are, and that, that's where in, including them in the tabletop exercises is a great way to uh, get, get that by and let them see uh, kind of what's possible, what, what's happened to other, other places and, at, at other organizations, uh, and let, let them get a sense of how things will happen and how uh, they will need to be involved in any uh, incident response as well. Uh, because it, uh, when, when you get something like, uh, I'm in Texas this week. The Texas ransomware on uh, municipalities that's been uh, going around in the la over the last week or two. Uh, I guarantee that the uh, executive leadership of the municipalities, have, uh, the mayor or the uh, city manager or whoever, uh, is involved in responding to those, even though they may not consider their job a cybersecurity position. Uh, they definitely have to be involved. Brennan, some of the challenges that the IT and the OT or the, the differences between the teams um, are going to induce during the recovery is that the IT is not necessarily going to understand uh, what it takes to recover some of the uh, processes that are involved from the OT side. And uh, it, it might be a complex process uh, um, and the, uh, it needs to be taken in consideration. Uh, additionally, everything uh, involved with uh, an incident uh, needs to be understood so that if people do start shutting off accesses and uh, to initiate some of that recovery, uh, you know, do their eradication first, uh, that they're communicating with the OT environment to understand what effect that's going to have on the actual processes, whether they're running or whether they've been taken down. So uh, there needs to be communication at this point uh, specifically as well. Thank you. Uh, so the net, uh, moving on from uh, the NIST cybersecurity framework, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the NIST 853 controls and the NIST 882 uh, overlay. Uh, so uh, if you're the NIST special special uh, the NIST special publication uh, 800 series is uh, uh, involves that and a uh, risk management uh, framework and uh, go in and there, there's quite a few of them. The 853 is an actual catalog of security controls. Uh, it has uh, quite a few security family families. Uh, we're not going to talk about all of them today because uh, that the 853 controls could be a course by itself. Uh, so obviously we're not going to talk cover them all in a one-hour webinar, uh, 
but uh, we'll, we'll highlight some of them that uh, you can that, that come into play when you st start talking about IT OT convergence and uh, monitoring and securing OT networks. Uh, the 853 controls are, are IT centric. Uh, they're, they talk about uh, information systems for the most part, uh, protecting information systems. Uh, the NIST uh, SB 882 uh, is an overlay for the controls, and it basically uh, picks out certain controls and says these are ones that uh, you should use in a high risk or a, a high criticality ICS network. These are ones that you should uh, use in a, a high, medium, and low criticality. Uh, if you have a high criticality network, that you should in, involve uh, these. You should use these controls. Uh, uh, or if you have a low one, you, you should involve uh, this subset and of, of, you should use this subset of controls. Uh, and, and then it also includes uh, advice for how to apply the controls to, uh, to ICS networks. Uh, the first one we're going to uh, talk about is the access control family. Uh, this is, is things like account management, uh, remote access to uh, to devices. Uh, we got a comment in the in the uh, question in the question form about third party management. Uh, vendor, vendor remote access is a big uh, is a big area of concern uh, right now. Uh, it, 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 when vendors. If, if a vendor is compromised, are they going to be able to compromise your network? That kind of thing. Uh, all that is uh, kind of a, a applied to the uh, access control family. Uh, kind, of, kind of some best practices that we would do uh, is is identifying uh, remote access uh, locations, log that access. Uh, this is the kind of thing that. Uh, if, if you are manually identifying uh, the remote access, uh, you, it, it's something that is very difficult to do manually. Uh, the more you can automate this collection, the more you can automate the uh, uh, identif identification of remote access and the, uh, uh, the, the Logins, all that kind of stuff, uh, or, or even just I automate the identification of uh, where remote access is coming from. Uh, do you have uh, third-party vendors uh, reaching out to your control network, re reaching down into your control networks uh, that you're that you're not aware of uh, by by monitoring that and trying to uh, and, and automating some of that identification. It allows you to uh, make, make compliant, showing that you uh, are using the controls uh, uh, much more accessible to your users. Uh, the, ne the next uh, control family is audit and accountability, and this obviously uh, th this is this gets into more. Uh, how you ensure that you are uh, make, getting the records you need and in, ensuring that you uh, are, are logging in the, those things that you need to prove for compliance. Uh, and again, uh, the IT space uh, has a long history of automating things, uh, uh, write, writing Everything from uh, writing scripts to uh, remotely uh, manage computers, all that kind of stuff. Those kinds of skills are things that you can use to uh, automate the collection of uh, the, of information uh, for on your OT network. Uh, take take that expertise that the IT people may have and, and use that to. Uh, to solve your problems, uh, uh, 
it, one thing that I like to point out is that you want to make sure that uh, your log in, and your log information includes uh, certain things like what it is, uh, when and where it is, uh, uh, who who was involved, and uh, packet capture of, of that information is a, is a is a good thing to have uh, uh, again so that you can uh, prove prove out what occurred. Uh, in, in my experience with uh, in, in compliance, uh, sometimes the difficulty isn't necessarily in uh, being compliant with the regulations, but in being able to prove that you are compliant with the regulations. And so that that's where uh, having a plan for how you're going to do that uh, can be very beneficial. Uh, the next one, security assessment and authorization family. Uh, uh, this is this goes to things like uh, are are you going to uh, how are you going to assess the devices? Don talked about this earlier with the uh, ICS 410 class from SANS. Uh, how how are you going to assess your network? Uh, you can do that in in a passive net uh, way or you can do that in a uh, more more active if, if, if you have that experience and knowledge then you, you can do something like that but but again getting uh, I, uh, what, what I love about ICS protocols is how much information is included in them because they're clear text and because uh, a lot of time, uh, for example when a engineering workstation connects to a device a lot of times the first thing that the uh, the uh, engineering workstation uh, program, like whether, whether it's RS Logix or something, uh, the first thing that it does is, hey, tell me about uh, all about yourself is what it says to the device. Uh, and, and the device sends that information and you can get that information off the network because it's in clear text and uh, automatically uh, cross-reference that with uh, CVE databases, all that kind of stuff, where you can automate some of this uh, asset inventory and uh, vulnerability assessment uh, processes. Yes, Brandon, and certainly the, you know, any assess security assessments, whether it's auditing like you were talking about before, or security assessments uh, within the OT environment, need to be coordinated with the OT personnel. There's uh, very specific considerations. Uh, that uh, need to occur so that they feel comfortable with the assessments, so that they uh, it does not impact the, the process, and so that th they can provide that information about why the clear tech protocols are necessary within uh, within the process itself and uh, what they're doing to if uh, working with the vendors if they're uh, if they can secure those and so forth. So that information, uh, the security assessments, the auditing needs to be coordinated, needs to be communicated with the teams. The OT absolutely wants this information for the reliability and uh, of their processes, but at the same time, it needs to be coordinated very well uh, so it doesn't, uh, uh, disruptions don't occur and so that uh, um, they understand that their processes are gonna be protected. We do cover that in uh, both the um, uh, both of the, uh, the ICS 410 class, uh, assessing and exploiting, and there's certainly uh, plenty of people out there that have experience doing security assessments within OT environments that know how to communicate with the uh, um, OT personnel uh, and help guide the, uh, the IT security teams uh, that are helping them with that. So the, the next family uh, we're going to look at is the configuration management family. Uh, this can be uh, quite difficult uh, and honestly if you're not automating this then it's almost impossible to do uh, the uh, configurations change too quickly uh, new devices come, come onto the network devices disappear from the network uh, devices are replaced on the network uh, all, all that kind of stuff uh, if you if you're doing the, this uh, asset inventory and configuration management manually, uh, then it's going to be out of date by the time uh, you go to use it. And it, it's, re uh, 
it, it's that's where it's really beneficial to have a automated network monitoring tool that allows you to uh, uh, identify ident identify configuration changes, identify asset inventory uh, events uh, uh, automatically, and uh, integrate that into your uh, e either your operational asset inventory tracking uh, or your compliance asset inventory tracking. Uh, And then uh, uh, kind of related to uh, who's, who's talking on the network is system and communications protection family. Uh, th this, this includes uh, baselining the network. Baselining can be very beneficial in OT networks. Uh, when we talk about the difference between IT and OT, uh, OT networks a lot of times are more static in terms of uh, you don't have uh, wireless devices coming on and off the network as often. You you you're not going out to the public internet as often or at all. Uh, uh, so baselining the network, baselining the communication patterns, uh, can can be a, a very doable project in the OT world, where uh, uh, network baselining uh, projects in the IT world can be. Uh, in order to reduce the number of false positives, you sometimes have to re open up the rules so much that uh, you're not really getting value from the project anymore in the first place. So that's where the uh, OT world, uh, with their long-running systems and their uh, uh, more consistent uh, traffic patterns and uh, uh, network patterns, uh, that, that can make, actually make securing them uh, you, through using a network baselining tool, uh, much uh, much more doable. Uh, and obviously, when you're uh, protecting these, you you want a broad based. Uh, uh, you want you want to have the ability to do a broad based identification of things. Uh, uh, a tool that only can identify denial of service attacks is not going to be as beneficial as something that identifies a, a broad cross-section of attacks. Uh, and then a, a tool where you're not able to visualize things is not going to be as beneficial as a tool where you can visualize th those things. So uh, those are the kinds of things that you would want to look for uh, in uh, doing a project to uh, secure or uh, meet the compliance requirements uh, on OT networks. Um, and then kind of related to that is the systems and information integrity uh, family. Uh, and this is uh, identifying uh, malicious code uh, on their on the devices, uh, identify what is what is running on, on the devices. Uh, and the more granular you can get with those, uh, the, the better it is, obviously. Uh, and again, if if you can, uh, if you're using a network security monitoring tool, uh, you you may get uh, you may you, you may not got you may not get 100% visibility on, on a network of, of all the asset inventory information you want, but if you can get uh, not 80 or 90% visibility uh, automatically, and instead of having to uh, manually get all of that, you're manually getting the, just the last 10 or 20 percent or whatever. That that's a real uh, cost savings uh, where you can provide, but with your compliance or your security tool, you can provide uh, bottom line cost savings to the business and allows you to get that buy-in. As we talked about, uh, getting that buy-in from the uh, from the executive leadership. Uh, the more use cases you can identify uh, and the more use cases that resonate with your uh, leadership of your organization, the easier that buy-in can be and the, the more you can, you may think that security is the most important thing, uh, but if you can uh, use those kind of compliance or 
uh, asset inventory or use cases like that, use those to get your security tools in, in uh, installed, then you can use them for what you want to use them for uh, be because you've got that buy-in from the, from the organization, uh, e even if that wasn't your primary use case. Uh, moving on to uh, the NERC SIP uh, requirements. Uh, the the NERC SIP standards uh, are all about securing North America's bulk electric system. Uh, so uh, electricity generation and transmission, uh, the, the big power lines you see uh, uh, running along the interstate or, or whatever. Uh, uh, the NERC SIP. When you work in the NERC SIP industry, uh, they like to they like to talk about uh, it, it can uh, NERC SIP violation can involve fines of up to a million dollars a day per violation. Uh, that that the largest fines to date has been a ten million dollar fine, uh, but uh, you're, that that's real money, uh, as they say. Uh, and again, uh, just like any other uh, com compliance regimen, uh, manually proving the compliance uh, can be a losing ball game. You need it is really helpful to uh, find ways to uh, automate, uh, not just automate compliance, but automate that you can prove that you are compliant, uh, which is sometimes the more difficult of the uh, two steps. Uh, we're only we're going to focus on a few of the uh, uh, NERC SIP standards today. The first one is uh, electronic security perimeters. Uh, this is basically if you have this basically uh, boils down to if you have uh, critical sy critical uh, cyber systems on your network, uh, they need to be uh, secured behind a uh, electronic security perimeter, so like behind a firewall, uh, that kind of thing. Not not uh, uh, not uh, available on the public internet, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then to go along with that, uh, connectivity uh, needs to be through a defined uh, electronic access point. Uh, this is similar to the uh, zones and conduits uh, idea from the Purdue model. Uh, where where uh, communication should flow through certain uh, only certain paths, uh, identified and controlled paths. Uh, this is uh, some kind of some of our uh, best practices recommendations uh, is to uh, identify uh, use deep packet inspection to identify uh, anomalous traffic at the uh, protocol level. So this is where uh, your firewall might include uh, uh, NetFlow logs, IP address, and uh, port number, uh, that that kind of thing. But then, uh, by having a dedicated uh, network monitoring tool that goes down to the protocol level, you're able to uh, have much more granular uh, rules and much more granular uh, 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 visibility. Uh, and then, uh, along with that, having a uh, network map is also another core functionality where it's one thing uh, to see a list of communication uh, rules on like a tabular format, but when you're able to look at a map and see what is, uh, what, what is highlight, what is on the map, who's talking to who, uh, those, those kinds of things that uh, break your expected uh, communication patterns are are very easily jump out to you when you have something like that. Um, uh, the next one is uh, SIP76 is about system security management, uh, uh, detecting malicious code, uh, uh, Identifying patches for devices and ensuring that they're installed, uh, that kind of thing. Those are kind of the two main areas uh, going to 
uh, going to talk about. Uh, the patch management one, identifying patches uh, basically once a month uh, and then applying them within another month uh, uh, is very resource intensive. Uh, I have that legal said I have to be clear that my comment that uh, the paperwork involved in meeting this is uh, directly leading to deforestation. Uh, that, that's a little bit tongue in cheek, but uh, there is a lot of paperwork involved, and if you are uh, manually doing this uh, acro across your enterprise, uh, that can be very difficult to to do, and you, you can drown in paperwork. So uh, it, it's really critical to automate this process. Uh, and kind of related to that, uh, prob probably the uh, SIP 7 and SIP 10 are, are the two most uh, paperwork intensive ones. Uh, I, I went back, I, I thought about moving that my, my uh, joke to uh, SIP 10 because uh, the baseline configuration is a, another one that can be uh, very, uh, very, very labor intensive if you're trying to do this manually, uh, identifying what software is running on devices, uh, and when when you're figuring out how to meet requirements like this, uh, this, this is where identifying your use cases and uh, de determining those and putting those into uh, your requirements on an uh, RFI or something like that is important because. Uh, uh, even though my background is in the uh, passive network security monitoring, uh, uh, you, you can't get detailed uh, uh, asset inventory like uh, is this specific patch uh, uh, installed on Windows devices. Uh, that requires an active component. And so uh, uh, that's why you have companies like Forescout are adding that kind of functionality. Uh, so uh, that's where really identifying your use cases, uh, real, really boiling down to uh, doing a technical uh, uh, proof of value uh, or, or technical uh, demo where you can say, hey, do you, do you meet these specific things? Uh, I, I really recommend when you're looking at uh, solutions uh, working, with, working with the vendor, working at, with the vendors, uh, uh, to identify uh, what those use cases are and uh, how, how the different vendors meet them. Uh, and again, uh, you can't uh, alert on changes in real time uh, manually. Uh, that, that if, if there's one thing to take away from this, uh, you can probably guess that that is uh, automate the process, find as many ways to automate things as you can, and uh, I identify that. Yeah, Brandon, the uh, uh, SANS does uh, provide a, a, a course on, on uh, uh, the NERC and uh, the, the NERC SIP. It's ICS uh, 456 Essentials for NERC Critical Infrastructure. And so if people are looking for additional guidance around that, definitely I would uh, recommend that they check out that course. Yep. Uh, yep. Uh, and so just to wrap up, uh, when you're looking at uh, compliance requirements in a converged IT and OT infrastructure, uh, you really want to uh, define your use cases, uh, ensure that w what you're looking at using uh, has end-to-end -end IT and OT uh, uh, visibility and expertise. Um, if uh, being uh, being installed into uh, OT networks with an IT centric uh, solution can can be uh, problematic. Uh, uh, and and so we want to make sure, uh, you, you, or you will want to make sure that you're uh, getting something that can that can uh, address both. That, that, that entire spectrum or continuum of uh, assets. 
Uh, yeah, I, Brandon, definitely one of the things that I'm seeing as I'm doing assessments with uh, uh, the, within the OT environments is the challenges that the IT security team they've they've now been tasked with. Uh, or they're being tasked more with uh, um, providing some guidance and uh, with responsibilities within the OT environment, and but they're they're not necessarily originally directly uh, communicating with them, directly involved with them, and they're trying to apply the IT policies, uh, the IT considerations into the OT environments, and without uh, proper consideration, this is uh, um, it's it's almost impossible to do that. Uh, just because the OT environments uh, can't comply with that. Uh, so there, there's always that challenge. And what it takes is communications between the IT teams, uh, the IT security teams, the OT environments, the uh, IT people that are um, supporting those environments as well, uh, to really look at a security program based on the things that you've outlined, uh, the leveraging the uh, NIST cybersecurity framework uh, uh, to kind of help to, to define a security program and then also uh, for some of the more tactical measures looking at the uh, NIST 882 uh, to help with some guidance around there. Uh, over at Cutaway Security, I've uh, um, just recently did a blog post about conducting security program maturity evaluations for ICS environments where I talk just about this, like about everything that you've been talking about, uh, Brandon, and how, how we approached it at one of the organizations that I assisted recently. So I wanted to point that out to the attendees uh, and they can uh, go there and uh, see uh, how we approach that, how we leverage uh, this for maturity of that uh, security program within the environment and give people a, a roadmap to go forward for these uh, this, this challenge. Thank you, sir. Yep. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have some resources available to you. Uh, uh, um, Carol Off is... Uh, going to from Sands is has a la couple last comments. Uh, I know these slides will be made available to you uh, uh, by via the Sands uh, uh, infrastructure. And uh, Carol, is there anything else you would like to add? Yeah, thank you so much, Brandon and Don, for your great presentation, and to Floor Scout for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the Sands community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.